Uh, I'd like sort of like to just preface my um, my uh, session today by saying thanks very much to the other two speakers. They've set the ground really well for the the issues that employers face, and, and most of you guys are employers or employees. And uh, I guess from my perspective, I need to be very cognizant of um, the fact that you know we do a lot of research into this area, but actually, if it doesn't work for our operational managers, our supervisors, and our people on the ground, uh, for their levels of understanding, but also um, give them practical tools in order to manage the fatigue in the workplace, then, you know, then we're really not hitting the mark. And uh, I think the way we look at fatigue in, in our organisation is the way we look at most things. It's, it's another thing that we have to manage. We have to be very careful. Um, I think um, the previous speaker spoke very uh, well about uh, the complexity of um, the issue of fatigue and sleep, etc. I guess you know if you put that all in, into the uh, the ballpark and say human beings themselves are very complex. You know we all have our own lives, we have our own ways of living, we have our own problems and issues, and many of those um, the issues that we see manifest themselves in the workplace. And so it is another thing that we have to manage, and we, it's something that we need to make our people very aware of but also allow them to uh, develop tools, techniques and tri uh, tricks in order to, um, you know, to look after their people. Uh, we don't want to treat everybody as, a, as an automatic robot and, and have only one way of doing things, but we do need thinking individuals in the workplace and we do need to be very self-aware of how we manage people and you know, how our people react to the way that uh, our work environment um, makes them uh, you know, interact as well when they go home. So who, who is down a group? Well, down to do a lot of things. And if you think about fatigue in all of these areas, you know, we do a lot of engineering works, uh, high transmissions. We do a lot of mining. We've done a fair amount of work with the mining that Matthew's talking about. We do work in that area. Uh, a lot of road works. We build, maintain trains, um, a lot of construction, etc. So, I mean, we come across fatigue in a lot of areas. And um, I sort of just like to give you my perspective on that. You've heard the term zero harm. I just want to sort of put that, that myth to bed, you know. Uh, zero harm is a philosophy to our organisation and that sort of flavours the way that we look at fatigue. It's not zero harm or zero injuries to people, although that's what we want to achieve, okay, over, over a long period of time. It's about the way that we look at zero harm to our business, to our shareholders, to our individuals in their wellness, not, ju not just in injury modes. You know, and we do want to make sure that we support the communities where we work. So uh, when we look at a problem such as fatigue, we're looking very much at a holistic view of how we might want to manage it in our business, you know, within the, the, the needs of the business and the individual. Now, fatigue is, is uh, very well covered, but from, from a layman's perspective, fatigue, you know, when we're managing it in the workplace, we can really only come at it from... Uh, from a couple of angles that uh, that we can one physically manage, and two actually um, have any impact on, you know how we um, how we meet our obligations in the workforce. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to cover some of those areas. But uh, to us, you know, when we're teaching our our managers and our supervisors, we tend to keep it uh, uh, relatively straightforward. You know, when people uh, are overexerted, they get tired, um, and if we continuously give them um, you know, concentration tasks to do um, over long periods of time, they will get fatigued as well. So we're, we're trying to keep it reasonably simple when we communicate the messages. We do give them a little bit, bit more detail, but um, when they have to communicate to their staff as well, they need to have few, you know, fewer words to use as well, um, just to help them understand what it is they're trying to manage, because otherwise it becomes one of those, those grey areas where we over-technicalise things to, to guys, um, when all they really want to know is, how do I do the job? And what have I got to do um, in order to make things work? Well, again, that's been well covered. But, you know, from a workplace perspective, we do see workplace accidents. And uh, we do, well, we're very aware of fatigue, um, in certainly in incident investigations that we have. We do try to eliminate it as one of the cause, um, in the same way that we look at stress, alcohol and drugs and other things, which is uh, obviously not the easiest thing sometimes to be able to to eliminate from your accidents, but you need to be able to do that in some way. Uh, when an organisation has policies and procedures and a, and a culture of looking at these things, you're more likely in the end of the day to be able to find those, uh, those pieces of information that help you understand why somebody did something um, that ended in, in a result that might not be been uh, what you desired. Um, but one that uh, we're very aware of 
in our business, particularly in, in the mining area and, um, and some of our long-term shift people, is the, the adverse quality of health that people end up with. So lack of sleep, long times working hours, um, not being able to socially interact with their families on a regular basis does lead to health effects on people. We see that, and it's already been mentioned, that people uh, lack the desire to exercise. Uh, they, they socially withdraw from, um, from their other working groups as well, and it just creates quite a vicious circle, which um, we need our managers and supervisors to understand and to look for in order to be able to intervene at some stage. Why should we manage fatigue? Well, you know, I spent a fair amount of my time dealing with regulators, and I thank very much WorkSafe for inviting us here. We do need to work together on this, um, and we do need to understand that employers... You know, ourselves, employees, do understand their duty of care. I guess in this area, it's, it's really one of those and it's areas where people are struggling to say, what do I do, how do I manage it, um, rather than they don't want to manage it. But, you know, we've seen occupational overuse syndrome. We've seen stress, mental health fatigue claims as well. Um, they're no less um, difficult to manage uh, than fatigue, but I think, you know, over time... If we keep pushing and keep talking, then uh, we'll find ways of dealing with these issues. I would say that, you know, in, in Australia, they've, they've got quite a, a view on some of these things. And uh, you know, Ma Matthew talked about um, fatigue management plans and other things like that. They've been well established over time. And I'd like to see some of those become commonplace here, particularly some of the large clients that we do business with uh, asking for them and certainly uh, maybe further down the line when we're looking at the regulations for the new uh, Health and Safety um, Act that's coming in, that there will be um, something that will cover fatigue and the requirements of employers to manage fatigue. I know that sounds like more compliance, okay, but uh, sometimes a shove in the right direction is, uh, is as good as anything else. Uh, from a business perspective, you know, I mean, look at all the things that we're trying to deal with. We've got to make money. That's why we're in business. You know, we've got to make sure our staff are happy. You know, we've got to make sure that we cope with the demands of the workplace. You know, it is a 24-7. You know, technology makes many things possible. You know, but there are limitations on us as people, which has been said before. You know, we do a lot of, uh, in our industry itself, emergency disaster work. You know, and that's why we're here in... in in Canterbury to deal with, um, you know, earthquakes and the infrastructure restoration. But, uh, you know, there are a lot of other emergency works that go on where we expect uh, superhuman things of some of our people. You know, we will wake them up at 3 o'clock in the morning and say we need you on shift for the next 20 hours, you know, and you've got to manage everything. You've got to deal with raging storms and torrents and slips. Um, and you've got to produce a really good job at the end of the day and make sure that everybody's safe. You know, it's, uh, it's a tough ask, isn't it? You know? And in the general industry, you know, there are continuous work processes, you know, manufacturing, um, other types of jobs or s cyclical operations, you know, peak season work, etc. cetera. Um, how do they affect people? How do they affect their, their sleep patterns? You know, sometimes there might not be regular work that you've got, but you're slotting people into that. You don't know them. You don't know what their current um, state of sleep is or, whether, or what the, their lifestyle is that may fit into that workplace. You know, a, a job we were doing a few years ago, we were behind schedule and it was a very large client and the client just pretty much said, the way to solve this is to put extra people on, okay, on night shift. But the issue really we had was um, there were high winds, it was dark, you know, heavy rains and storms, um, not least of all taking people down into, uh, into the south, down towards Twizel area, um, was not best place to recruit staff at any one time. So, you know, putting a night shift on and just putting gung-ho to get things working is perhaps not the right suggestion. Um, and I think, um, I'd like to think that uh, ourselves and some clients have worked those issues out over time, um, but I know there's still some clients that don't get it. So how can we manage fatigue? Well, it's not really difficult, you know, if you start thinking of fatigue as another hazard in the workplace. Um, I know that sounds simplistic, but, you know, employers need to be able to just take it by a size chunk. Now, let's identify the factors which can cause fatigue in the workplace and assess the risks that might arise from that. You know, we then need to control those risks. Um, but find, find controls that are reasonably practicable. And I'm using that term because the new legislation will use 
uh, we'll use that, you know, reasonably practicable in the circumstances. And that takes account of the size of organisation, where you are on your safety journey, etc. And that's just as important. But, you know, you also have to remember that there are lots of organisations here that you can share and learn from, which is one of the reasons why we're here too, and not be shy of passing on information and processes, um, which Dan or isn't either. Fletcher's are quite happy to, um, to show you what's happening. They're quite open and honest, and I think the other organisations on, on the skirt are too. But one of the things that isn't done very well is that we set policies, processes in place, and then we don't, we don't check them over time. We don't, we don't go out and look to see that they're working as planned. We don't consult with our staff well enough to make sure that we understand the issues, um, to make sure that you know, at the end of the day, we are going to manage fatigue in, a, in a, a proper way, in an identifiable way with our staff. And it isn't going to be the same for every work site, even using the same policies and procedures in the same company. I'm an engineer too, so I look at things in a sort of a linear way, and I love flow charts, but you know, really what I'm saying is, you know, use your risk management approach you know, in your organisations. You've got hazard and risk management identification tools. You, know, you just need to know what it is you're looking for, and there's plenty of uh, advice and research about that. Um, make sure that you have a system you know, that, that um, incorporates your, your health and safety, and fatigue is part of that system. You know, but make sure that it's adaptable to changes as new research comes on board, as new um, people come into your workplace, it needs to be adaptable too. Um, make sure that you identify and assess the various tasks that individuals do that create the fatigue, not just look at one task in isolation or a group of tasks and say, well, we're only going to use rostering um, because we know that people are not getting enough timing, but look at how you interface contractors, subcontractors, look at the various stages of the work that you're doing, okay? and look at the tools that you're using over time in the phases of the work that might intervene when fatigue might present itself to people. Okay? So we're, we're just talking about having a process, um, make sure that everybody understands their roles and responsibilities. You know, it's funny... We, we say that supervisors have to do a lot of things, and now we say they're responsible for fatigue as well. And we've heard that training helps with that. But, you know, what does a supervisor do when somebody is fatigued? Does he know what he's allowed to do in the workplace? Can he remove them, reassign them? You know, can, can he assign someone to go for a micro-sleep, and where would he do that? You know, it's actually, we actually have to set the ground rules as an organisation of what we're expecting of our people. OK, otherwise, you know, they, they've got to make those decisions. And sometimes it's unfair on them to, you know, to particularly in, in adverse conditions, to be able to do that when they're short-staffed. You know, our policies and procedures have to be robust and people need to know what they are. Um, but lastly, I mean, fatigue reporting processes. Who's got a formal process in their organisation that allows staff to self-report fatigue and to be able to intervene when they know there's a problem? You know? Enough said? Not many hands, but you actually need to get to that stage over time that staff can trust you and your organisations. And you know, yes, there'll be the odd guy that's swinging the lead who needs a, a bit of a sleep because he's he's a bit hungover or done something else. But you need to get over that hump so that staff understand that when they're unsafe at work, that you will allow them, you know, to to self or to intervene together to deal with it. Now, obviously, if someone's turning up lots of times and he's tired and sleepy, then you might have a different view on, on, on how to deal with it. But if you don't set the ground rules in the environment, then that, it's never going to happen. You need a fatigue, risk, a fatigue risk management policy that outlines people's obligations in, in relation to fatigue in the same way that you do in many other uh, ways of managing safety issues. You know, I haven't seen too many organisations have actually got a policy around fatigue. They've got a smoking policy and a health and safety policy and stuff, which is very generic, you know. But that doesn't, again, outline the responsibilities that people need, need to understand in order to discharge them. Again, you know, fatigue is part of your health and safety management system. And if you're in industries where fatigue is ever present, then you'll have better systems than others. But, you know, all of your health and safety management systems need to outline are three key areas, you know, what do management do, supervisors and employees, you know, and how do they interact? You know, but management need to be made aware of the effects of fatigue in the workplace, so we have to show them, tell them, um, 
explain to them how we want them to operate, what kind of rostering, what kind of processes that we're going to, going to use in the workplace. You can't assume that all managers know that. You know, some of our young contract managers that are coming out of university, you know, they haven't known anything else except schooling and university, and they've got a life, lifelong uh, learning to do yet. You know, shifting them around to different uh, parts of the organisation is one thing. But where do they get all this knowledge of how, of how a supervisor should operate, all the things that he's got to manage, you know, and then support those supervisors and the employees in what they're doing? So we have a lot of education to do of, of our managers over time to make sure they get it right too. It's not just what the employees do. Uh, and of course, managers get pretty tired, stressed and grumpy too. Um, but who, who supports them when that happens? So actually having a network of people in the organisation that people understand, that, that understand the processes, besides HR, I should say. There's not too many people presenting with these things want to go and speak to HR. I'm not sure why that is, but uh, it might be a guy thing. Um, but supervisors, you know, we, we expect our supervisors to, to do carry out checks um, with our people on identifying fatigue and communicating and interviewing people on, you know, the, the effects that they're having. And some of them are not comfortable with that, you know. We actually have to show them, train them, and set the environment so they can do that. Otherwise, the tools that we've got only work at a superficial level. Um, but also, you know, if, if, we're going to, if we're really serious about fatigue, then we need to give them some authority as well in order to be able to intervene in the workplace without any comebacks from the managers, okay. It's, it's a similar issue that we have with drugs and alcohol. You know, the first couple of times someone might be feeling the effects and they haven't been tested, then that might be okay for some intervention. But at some points, the supervisor needs to hold people to account. And fatigue is one of those issues too. That some people do regularly come to work fatigued, um, tired, and they, have, they make silly slips and mistakes. Um, it might not be their fault, but they need, we do need tools to deal with the issues. I'm not going to expect you to read all that because you can get it in the presentation, but you know, we, again, we look at it in five areas. We're looking at the mental and physical demands of the work, so assess what those are going to be in the tasks that you're doing. Make sure that the work scheduling and planning is appropriate for the tasks that are going on. And if it looks as though people are going to be overstretched, then consider putting extra people on. I know it's a time and cost issue, okay? But, you know, sometimes you'd be better off uh, putting more people on for short periods of time um, rather than overstretching those, those people that, uh, you know, might be just the experts, but, you know, they're performance is going to degrade anyway, so you're not actually going to achieve any, uh, the aim that you wanted in the first place. You know, the working time, make sure there's sufficient working time to do the tasks that people, uh, that you're asking of them. But including in working time as well is, is it's okay saying to people, I want you on, on the job at a particular time of day, and you know in long projects that we have that the travel times to and from accommodation and uh, you know, and other, other things that they've got to do have to be factored in as well because they're going to appear in the workplace if they've been up at five o'clock and you're starting them at nine uh, because it's a long distance and you expect them to go back again. You've got to factor in all those times. You know, driving after a, a, long, day's, a long day's work um, has already been, already been covered, but we see a whole lot of accidents caused you know, by those micro-sleeps on people and we've, we've, we struggle quite, uh, quite a lot, particularly in, in Australia, uh, with that issue and you know, even intervening, um, preventing people, we're putting interlocks on some vehicles so they, they literally stop after periods of time um, and you can't, you, know, you can't drive much further. Um, they're, they're all just tools and, and as Matthew said, they're, uh, they're, technology is great but you've got, got to put it in a wider perspective on how to manage issues you know, and you can't just uh, tell people not to do things, you've got to enable them to do things. I'll give an example in transportation, okay, the, you know, drive, we all know that driving is, is a difficult task, you know, that, that can end up in fatal consequences, and the link between uh, sleep and uh, driving issues is well researched, you know, and of course, you know, that, that's translated into uh, stricter laws in the aviation, the trucking, and the rail industries, which are very well regulated, but the current law doesn't cover well you know, the issues that we're talking about today in fatigue, um, insofar as work schedules and, and practices to reduce stress and fatigue. Um, and I've already, men already mentioned that I'm hoping the new regulations might look into that, you know. But I also um, want to mention, too, that the new legislation, you might not be aware, um, asks you to do this thing called SFARP, that's so far as is reasonably practicable, 
Okay, now for most people don't, you know, that I talk to are not in health and safety, have difficulty with that concept. If I'm looking at a hazard, and then I go through that process of eliminate, isolate, minimise, that's managing hazards. So far as reasonably practical is over here is what knowledge do I have, what training, what education? Do I comply with the legislation? Do I train my people? You know, and do I review everything that I do? That's the test in legislation that's coming out in your workplace health and safety legislation. And you should be ready for that. And if you apply that principle to the, the managing fatigue, okay, there's a whole lot more you've got to do than just look at the hazard and put a policy in place. You actually have to demonstrate that what you're putting in place is, is fair, it's reasonable, you've consulted staff, and it has a, you know, it has a, a chance of working. You know, otherwise, you know, if you do get into difficulty and, and fatigue is an issue, and you end up in front of the regulator, um, you can expect some tough questions you know, based on the new expectation of so far as reasonably practicable, not just managing the hazard. I'm not going to dwell on this, but uh, you know, we've, we've experimented many times with driving um, monitors. This one's in, in a car. This is, uh, some of this is becoming um, inbuilt now as uh, standard production models. This is a Lexus. Uh, they do monitor. They, they look. Uh, they, they beep. They put the brakes on if you're not reacting. Um, again, it's a tool. One I like is, is like apps, and there's apps for almost everything at the moment, you know, but you need an iPhone, a smartphone. Um, you can put your own um, say, score in there. You can monitor your own um, uh, circadian rhythms. And some of them has got these fit. You've seen those wristbands that you have, and that gives you management, exercise, your sleep, and everything else. You can plug into your iPhone, and you can do self-monitoring that way. Okay, so lessons from other industries. I mean, we do work in the mining area too, and these are commonplace, okay? You would be expected to have fatigue management plans in place for your site and for all your people. Um, you are expected to demonstrate you've got shift rostering and rotation. You know, you fly in, you fly out, you drive in, drive out people. And they're closely monitored and they're, they're um, uh, audited on a regular basis, uh, both by the client and the regulators. Um, we're seeing the use of inbuilt systems. I've just showed you one on a car, but Caterpillar's teamed up with um, a company called, called Seeing Machines. So they're automatically fitting these, um, you know, driver monitor alerts within those heavy vehicles. Um, and you know that's that's a good thing, but it's it's not uh, the solution. Um, we have experimented a lot with Opt Alert with these, these glasses, and you know they're, again that's a limited tool, uh, only as effective as the time of day, the wearer, etc., and the self-reporting of the stuff. Uh, we don't we have some privacy issues around data and stuff with unions and things, which is again not a bad thing, but uh, it's sort of you have to look at all the results that you get in a common sense way. Um, we do have fatigue monitoring and self-reporting, so we, we encourage people to self-report for fatigue when they come on shift in the morning, you know, and they can be honest, and nobody's going to, to say you can't work, um, but we want to know what, what serious limitations there might be, and, you know, we work with some, some quite dangerous equipment, and if that person is self-reporting and monitoring, then we expect the supervisor to, to at least work the, do the work schedule so that uh, they can cope with that. Um, we do give the tools... Uh, supervisors tools in order to monitor fatigue um, and we do a lot of drug and alcohol testing in the in the mining area particularly you have to before you come into the gate you have to do an alcohol test if you blow anything above zero you can't start your shift um, you wait half an hour and if you're still above zero then you don't work at all that day um, there's a lot of random drug testing as well and um, some of that is because we've got a lot of people in camps who you know uh, who, are, who are lonely um, who have other issues. Uh, EAP is used quite extensively in counselling. Um, but we learn a lot from, from how people um, interact with others or don't interact socially uh, in camps. And uh, you know, a lot of that does manifest itself in fatigue in, in many different ways, you know, which we, we don't fully understand, but uh, we are aware of it. So what would expect you to see? We'd expect you to see and develop, as you do in your hazard system, this is just the beginning of a, a, a fatigue risk control matrix. On the left-hand side is the, um, the work scheduling, planning, exposure, communication strategy, etc. That flows into control categories, and then you'd expect 
from the control categories, the actual types of controls, the allocations of responsibilities, the review dates, etc. So it's a risk management system that you expect to see anywhere else, and that just helps you inform when you should do training. You know whether your controls are effective over time. How when was the last time you visited it? It's a way of monitoring it uh, within your organisation in a in a structured way. I put up a few few policies. There's um, it was mentioned by Matthew, but uh, we do have a fitness for standard um, a standard for fitness for work, and that includes uh, fatigue, drugs and alcohol, and other areas. This is just the front page of it, but. Uh, um, it's, it's like I said, you actually have to build it into your culture, you have to build it into your processes, your systems, staff have to be comfortable you know, talking about fatigue um, and, and other issues that they might have in order to be able to you know, self-report, which is actually where you want people to be at. We do use a fatigue scorecard, and this is a very simple Excel spreadsheet. We use it for rostering and planning. A very quick way, a manager can just look at the hours he's going to be allocating to people or look at the hours over a period of time in the job so he knows when to, to schedule more staff or to, you know, um, to make sure that he pulls a particular member off when he's exceeding his work hours in an area. Or he might want to reduce the work hours in an area because he's aware that fatigue in that particular job um, is, is more prevalent than others. Um, and we also use it, uh, one of the first things we do when we do an incident investigation, we have a look at the hours, work, shift roster, etc. It's part of the process. It's not a way of pointing the finger at people or finding another excuses. It's just another thing we need to understand when we're looking at the overall picture of when an incident's occurred. Now, we do have a pre-start form, and we do expect um, people to uh, talk about fitness for work. And, uh, and, of course, with the training you're giving your supervisors and managers, that does include fatigue, and there's some other tools for, for doing that. Uh, in our fatigue management plan, this is the, the front page, and uh, it does expect project managers to implement the fatigue plan wherever shift work is identified. So we're not telling them, you, know, you just got to wait for the client to tell you. Uh, we're saying when there's shift work, and there's some other areas that we, we have mandatory fatigue plans as well, you're going to do it anyway because we're, we're worried about it. It's part of our risk. Um, we do want supervisors to monitor their staff um, and to assess the situation, but we do need to give them the tools in order to do that. And for employees, we make it very clear that you present for work fit for duty, and if you're not fit, then be honest and hold your hand up, and we'll work with you, whether that's, you know, um, just on one occasion, or it's part of a wellness program, you know, or it's or it's part of a, an EAP program, or whatever else. You know, the help is there. We'll show you what we've got. We want you to use it, and there won't be any any recriminations unless you know there's an obviously serious situation. Um, and we do want them, of course, to notify their supervisor at any time of the day when they feel that they're unfit for work. A part of that fatigue management plan gives them tools of looking at the, the levels, and we use the traffic light colours as well, uh, low, medium and high, and that translates into suggested actions for the supervisors and what they might do when someone seems to be presenting with a, with a certain level of fatigue. Um, we usually look at the intervention level at um, sort of the high end of the medium at a high risk is where we, we have mo more success. Um, I guess supervisors are still reluctant at some stage to, to intervene in the medium level because they're never quite sure uh, themselves um, exactly what they're dealing with. Now, this is part of an assessment for the supervisors that we train them to use. It comes in three stages. The first one is observation. They're looking at an individual, and this is part of the process on some of the jobs that we do. People present for work, they go through a process for fitness, and so, you know, some of that is um, high-risk confined space entry work we do. We do stringing helicopters to transmission lines and things like that, so we, we make people go through a fitness for work before we do a shift. The shifts are quite short, but we, we really need to uh, understand that people are, are thinking, you know, and they're not going to be distracted. Um, we look at the physical, whether people are showing physical signs. Um, and, and we're, we're talking about looking and just making subjective judgments. I'll come to um, how we deal with that in a moment. We, we're asking people, you know, if someone's having trouble making decisions or, you know, that, that's really a sort of, uh, there's a training around, you know, people have difficulty making decisions over a period of time. You know, it's not just something today I'm having trouble making decisions. Uh, we're looking at the tasks mainly. 
And that's, that's where our, our supervisors focus most of their time on, you know, are they, are they fit for the task? You know, and they, they rely very heavily on the individual telling this information. Now, it's, a, it's a crude tool, but it's something that gets our people to asking the questions. Now, if there's any one of those red boxes ticked, then they go straight into the second phase, which I'll show you. But if they're all green, then, then that person's uh, deemed fit to carry on with the work for that day. In the conversation with the individual, which is where we, we spend a lot of time training our supervisors and some of our younger managers um, to interview people, to have open and honest conversations, um, we're asking them about their sleep, you know, what their work patterns have been like, uh, how long their breaks have been, you know, in, 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 usually in the preceding week or two weeks, um, and how, they, how the individual normally manages their fitness for work. So we are expecting them to tell us how they're managing you know, their fitness for work, and if they're having difficulty, you know, are they getting enough exercise, are they using AAP, all, all those other things. I mean, some of the sites that we have, we have on-site facilities where there are counsellors there all the time that help people with uh, you know, day to day issues. And some of that some of that gets rid of this family life stuff, you know, can't call the bank, all those things that might worry people, and trying to eliminate some of those issues that we can get down to um, the core. And lastly, um, if it's deemed necessary to intervene, what does the supervisor have at his at his um, his call? So if the risk of the level associated with the person um, is there, then uh, should they be allowed to continue? Should we give them a task rotation or a short break, or should we uh, send them home? Uh, has the person had fitness for work issues before? Um, so we're trying to, trying to um, ask the right questions, okay? But it's one of those things that, you know, it's, it's a touchy subject, and it is a, a subject that you've got to be careful with your staff so that they, they trust what you're doing and you build the culture over time. But without your policies, your procedures, and your responsibilities clearly communicated, then enabling people to ask these questions and to work with people uh, with that trust level um, isn't going to happen. Um, and all our workplaces are assessed for hazards on a regular basis, and we, we recognise fatigue. And it's just a, it's a name there that says fatigue, and it's a box. But obviously the people doing these hazard assessments um, understand what it is they're looking for. And so when they tick that box, they have to go into a, a different procedure to try and eliminate it. Or try and work with the individual to make sure that it doesn't uh, become a problem. Uh, we have commuting plans on a regular basis. A lot of people do a lot of driving and working. So those commuting plans look at our fatigue management procedures and if there's any, anything that strays outside the norm in the, in the fatigue management procedure, then that person is pulled from that shift and given alternative roles or different work to do in a different area. So we, we're fortunate that we've got many sites and depots where we can employ people. And if it's, uh, if it's at all possible, those people are, you know, we, we multi-skill and train people anyway, particularly in the mining area that we've got, you know, we reassign them to different areas until we can solve the problem, uh, you know, drive in, drive out type thing. So where to from here? Well, you know, from a contractor's perspective, you know, ensure that you actually carry out hazard and risk assessments for fatigue. Look at your work tasks and rotations and keep them up to date. You know, you're going to do different jobs, um, you're going to have different staff come on board. Uh, you're going to use different equipment, uh, different times of day, your working environments. Uh, use a range of tools. Try and develop what works for you and your organization. Uh, make sure that um, you can achieve this SFARP, not a LARP. So you need to, to continually keep up to date with um, your information, with your checking and verification. Uh, make sure that uh, your, your controls are still effective over time. You know, so people start to use the tools, then they don't see the benefit of them anymore and nobody checks, so they don't become used anymore. And then the effectiveness of what you're trying to achieve is lost. Um, and lastly, you know, use forums like this um, to share industry knowledge, to share processes and systems. It's not secret. Health and safety is one of those areas that we should all be uh, sharing information on, um, not just um, in, in so far as fatigue, but in everything, and not be shy on sharing it. Um, and I, I applaud WorkSafe for uh, organising forums like this because, you know, they are quite rare in, in New Zealand and we need more of them. So thanks very much. <laughs>